Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In the orbit, it's important that you make bony cuts that are adequate to expose the entire contents. The contents of the orbit are contained then within a periosteal cone, which we will take advantage of in keeping our, the contents intact. Now, when we consider this area first, you have already taken and dissected away the periosteum overlying the frontal bone in this region. Now we want to extend that reflection down to the superior orbital rim, being sure that we identify on the dry skull and be sure not to reflect the area of the trochlea, which is located here. The reflection then of periosteum should continue, pressing it down such that the periosteal envelope is maintained. Now you'll notice that the cuts have been made then above the level of the trochlea and up in this region, and laterally, actually we could have extended this cut even more into this region and come across to give us a little more lateral access. Superiorly, the cuts are extended down in this region, and this area of the roof of the orbit is somewhat variable. In some individuals, you'll find that this is very, very thin, and in fact, you may find that the frontal sinus has extended and is undermining this area of the orbit, uh, so that you'll actually find two layers of bone, one on the brain side, then sinus, and one on the orbital side. With the bone removed, and you'll notice that we've had to remove some additional bone here, your laboratory instructor has an instrument which will allow him to do so carefully and can extend this for you. You'll notice here now an intact periosteal envelope enclosing then the contents of the orbit. If you look through that periosteum, and I'll press it down a little bit here so that we can see it, you will find the most superficial structures that you'll want to identify showing right through the periosteum. Here, for example, and extending out in this region is the frontal nerve and its supraorbital branches. In this region, we can see the trochlear nerve extending over across the superior aspect of the orbit. To protect those, we want to lift the periosteum and with that lifted, we can then cut the periosteal envelope open without damaging the structures which are deep to it. Now we'll reflect that and identify, in fact, the frontal nerve. And you can see it rather nicely right here. Here is the nerve itself. And you will notice another thing in this area. There's a lot of periorbital fat. This fat is important as a functional fat. It maintains the globe in an anterior position and allows movement of the muscular elements. It is, however, a problem in terms of dissection. As you dissect this area, we want to follow out a structure and then remove the fat from it. Don't remove fat blindly or you will find that you have destroyed much of the structure of this area. Now we've done that in the next head, and we'll be working on the opposite side here so that you do have a right-left difference, midline, of course, being here. Here again, we can see the frontal nerve, which you just looked at earlier, and its extensions anteriorly. Another nerve, which is superficial and can be identified easily, is the nerve the trochlear nerve to the superior oblique muscle, which is located in this region. This nerve you'll want to maintain during this entire dissection, so be sure to identify it and keep it well marked during the entire procedure. Laterally, we can see a nerve passing over in this region and associated with it a vessel. Again, this is an injected specimen so that we can see quite a bit of red for the vessels. This is the lacrimal nerve passing over to the lacrimal gland. We have freed the deep portion of the lacrimal gland, which we'll remove now so that we can show this area. 
With the lacrimal gland removed, I would like to now remove the frontal nerve and its branches. Here we have the supertrochlear and another, excuse me, this is the supraorbital and supertrochlear here. And we'll cut that to allow us to get a more clear view of the muscular components that you will need to identify next. The entire dissection guide and the approach is a layered one. In other words, as you unpack one layer of fat after another, you will expose the entire contents of the orbit. We've identified the superficial layer, and the muscular layer is the next one, and its superficial aspects. Now, we have already cut this muscle. Its entirety would be here. This is the levator palpebrae superioris, and you can see its entire attachment here to the lid. Before making the cut in this region, the nerve supply to this muscle approaches it from its deep surface, so that if one carefully reflects it and then makes the cut subsequently, you can maintain nerves supplying the levator at this point. The muscle which lies deep to the levator then is next demonstrated very nicely. The superior rectus here which again has been sectioned to allow you to reflect the muscle posteriorly and to demonstrate entering its deep aspect a branch of the ocular motor nerve, the superior division of it, passing into that muscle at this point. Deep to this muscle, you'll notice another nerve which, like the trochlear nerve, runs a lateral to medial course. And this, then, is the nasociliary nerve. If you look carefully and pull it gently posteriorly, you can see that it has given off an anterior ethmoidal branch at this point, and then continues forward, then, as the infratrochlear nerve. The posterior ethmoidal is frequently a very superficial nerve and comes off and passes in this region. In this particular specimen, we did not find one. In terms of the remaining recti muscles, we're now inside a cone of attachment of these muscles, and I'm going to remove the, one of the branches of the ophthalmic artery. You should become familiar with the branches of the ophthalmic artery, mainly from your text, as they frequently are very difficult to demonstrate within the globe. Once that artery has been removed, one can see lying here on the lateral aspect of the orbit, the, excuse me, on the medial aspect of the orbit, actually, the medial rectus muscle and a spray of nerves entering that muscle. And if we look down in here, we can see perhaps a little better the nerve stalk, if you want, or trunk at this point. Again, a branch of the ocular motor supplying the medial rectus muscle. If we look across over here, we can see very nicely the lateral rectus muscle, which is located here, and passing through the tendinous ring and into its medial aspect is the abducens nerve. Associated with the globe, are a few more structures that we'd like to look at. Here, for example, is the trochlea, and you can see the tendon, then, of the superior oblique passing to the globe at this point. The optic nerve itself, if the globe is held forward as it is in life, is located right here. Lateral to it, you will find the area of the ciliary ganglion, but if you dissect this area carefully, you will also find some long branches of nerves passing from this posterior portion of the eye forward to enter the globe. These are long ciliary branches at this point. Now what I would like to do is to cut the optic nerve to show you the inferior oblique muscle and the inferior rectus muscle. 
With the optic nerve sectioned, we can now reflect it to identify the inferior rectus muscle. Here, we can see its associated nerve supply and passing then laterally the supply to the inferior oblique muscle. In review then, we see that the four recti muscles form a cone of muscle. The superior rectus located here, the lateral rectus here, medial rectus here, and then finally deep to the optic nerve, the inferior rectus here. To demonstrate then the inferior oblique, we need to pass anteriorly, and we'll do that by incising in this area. Now, let me just reorient the head for you. Um, okay, this is the inferior aspect of the orbit. If we palpate this region, we can find the inferior orbital margin, make a semilunar incision, reflect orbicularis oculi, and locate again the inferior margin of the orbit, and here we see the septum, the inferior orbital septum. That septum then needs to be incised so that we may demonstrate the inferior oblique muscle. Here we can see that muscle now that we've cleaned away the fat. This is the inferior oblique muscle. It's the only muscle of the eye which has its attachment anteriorly, as you can see here, at the level of the lacrimal crest, and it then passes to the globe in this direction. You can see its nerve supply here, and you'll notice the muscle fiber orientation of the inferior rectus muscle in contrast to the oblique at that point. And that completes, then, your view of the orbit. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.